So we're here with um, Federico Fuentes from the Australia Venezuela Solidarity Network, and also with uh, Green Left. And we want to focus on uh, COVID nineteen in Venezuela, and also, I guess, a bit more broadly in Latin America as well. And now, Venezuela has done remarkably well compared to other Latin American countries, and I mean, obviously, especially compared to the United States, in dealing with COVID nineteen. But and this is all under the fact that it's under a sanctions regime as well. So that actually makes it doubly remarkable. Can you just start off? Uh, Fred, by just laying out what is the situation for people who aren't familiar with it, how has Venezuela gone in dealing with COVID-19? Yeah, I think uh, part of the importance or way to understand how Venezuela has gone about uh, combating COVID-19 is important to consider two contexts. Uh, The first is one that you mentioned, which is the very large and devastating impacts of the economic sanctions, mainly imposed by the United States, but also a number of other European countries, uh, has had in general on the Venezuelan economy, um, but also specifically on the health system. Uh, So much so where it can essentially be said that in large parts, the uh, hospital system, public hospital system in Venezuela has largely collapsed um, over the last few years. So of course, in a context of what COVID-19 pandemic has meant in other countries, this meant it was almost, you know, it was vital um, that the government was to move quickly uh, to try to suppress it and stamp it out before it got under control. The second important aspect, though, to remember as well is that whilst on the one hand, the public hospital system uh, has largely collapsed, uh, at the local level, um, the, the networks that have been built Uh, involving uh, local doctors, in many cases, uh, Cuban doctors, together with uh, health committees, uh, local community activists, communal councils. It's played an important role in sort of uh, creating a strong culture of preventative medicine, of community health, um, and and general uh, health awareness uh, amongst the the, the population in Venezuela. So this was really the strong point that the government had uh, in its pocket to be able to deal with, with COVID-19. So how did it respond? As, almost as soon as word came out of the pandemic um, or the outbreak of COVID-19 uh, in China, the Venezuelan government very quickly uh, engaged the Chinese government to work out what was happening and how it could begin to, to combat uh, COVID-19 uh, once it was to hit Venezuela or to try to stop it hitting Venezuela. Uh, we very quickly, within a few months, uh, it began to stop uh, international travel or certainly quarantine those that were coming in uh, to the country. And also, once the first few cases uh, emerged in Venezuela, very quickly moved from a regional uh, lockdown of a couple of uh, states through to an entire national uh, lockdown or quarantine, as, as they call it, uh, where essentially uh, everyone was to uh, stay home except for the absolute most basic needs, uh, shopping for food. Uh, healthcare, um, whilst using an online platform that the government set up uh, to let the government uh, and local health officials know if they had any symptoms so that doctors and community activists could go to their home to test them uh, to see uh, who was um, testing positive for COVID and where those cases were found to be uh, positive with COVID, uh, being able to find them uh, a suitable venue uh, for them to receive treatment uh, if that was possible at home. Um, then that happened at home. But if cramped living conditions meant that that was not possible, then they were moved uh, into, into uh, specially designed venues uh, or, or local health, um, uh, local health centres uh, in order to be uh, treated there. Essentially, what, what, was, what, was of the, what is of the health system was dedicated fully uh, to, to dealing with, with COVID. And that had a really remarkable success. And even to date, uh, Venezuela has, as you said, pretty much been leading uh, the region uh, in terms of uh, a low level of cases and, and deaths. Um, what we are, though, seeing is that added to, those, uh, to that problem of the economic sanctions that, that was mentioned before, Venezuela is now encountering another big problem uh, in trying to deal with COVID, and that is the return of many Venezuelans. Uh, as, as is quite well known, there's been a large emigration of Venezuelans uh, over the last few years due to the economic and political situation. Many of those um, migrants, um, as with the case of many migrants around the world, have found themselves with little to no protections uh, in the countries where they've uh, gone to reside. And in that context, many have chosen to go home. So we've essentially seen something like 70,000 Venezuelans return back to the country over the last two, three months. Almost most large, the last bulk of them 
crossing from the Colombian border. So that's essentially Venezuelans returning from Ecuador, Peru, Colombia. Now, government's tried as best as possible to provide for quarantine measures um, in order to uh, allow everyone, of course, to return home, but in a, in a safe manner uh, where everyone is tested and, and where everyone is, is ensured that there's not a, a, a spread uh, of the virus. Uh, but what we've seen is that just in the last few weeks, uh, following a, a relaxation of that nationwide quarantine, uh, the government has had to go on, has had to go back into a hard quarant- a hard lockdown uh, in particularly the border states and in Caracas, given the, the large um, poor neighbourhoods that, that exist there. Uh, and this has been, as, as I said, in large part uh, due to, due to the having to deal with this um, return of, of Venezuelan residents or who in many cases wanting to uh, escape quarantine, uh, been crossing the, the very porous Venezuelan-Colombian uh, border uh, through, through many different means. So there's a big challenge, but as I've said, importantly, the government has faced with a, a, a health system or particularly a hospital system would never have been able to deal with this situation, uh, been forced or chosen to, to rely on the mobilisation of, of local health committees, of, of local doctors uh, to really tackle, tackle this issue. In the sort of topsy-turvy, black is white world of the Western media, uh, Venezuela is presented as being a dictatorship and Maduro is a dictator. Um, and we've got also this you know, supposed uh, self-declared uh, presidential alternative one Guaido. Um, nearby we have Bolivia where there's been a coup taking place but in the eyes of the Western media at least at the time when it was happening that was presented as a as a as a uh, step towards you know democracy or can you can you explain how the the different responses have been in in Venezuela compared to Bolivia and, and in particular with reference to this um to this question of democracy Certainly, uh, but just just before I get to that point, though, I, because you mentioned uh, Juan Guaido and uh, as the supposed interim president, I think that's another factor to include in just how difficult the situation has been for Venezuela to deal with. Uh, because very early on, for example, um, the Venezuelan government applied to the International Monetary Fund uh, in order to receive a loan for emergency health work uh, to be able to combat uh, COVID nineteen, but precisely because the IMF uh, has, uh, if I want to be generous, remain neutral uh, on who is the actual president in Venezuela, whilst in practice really recognising Juan Guaido as the president, said that he was unable to facilitate those loans. The same thing has happened with the European Union. The same thing has happened with attempts by Venezuela to get access to its gold in the Bank of England. Uh, all of these have been attempts to try to use or access funds uh, to, be able to, COVID, uh, to be able to combat COVID-19 but has consistently been undermined by this uh, spurious uh, interim presidency of, of Juan Guaido that has received the backing of, of just a handful of, of Western nations, while the majority of the uh, countries in the world continue to recognise President Maduro um, as the legitimate president of Venezuela. Of course, the, you know, when we contrast this with, with Bolivia, we also there have an interim president um, in, in, the, in, in the form of uh, Janine Añez, um, however, this, this is an interim president who actually is the de facto head of state because she was able to come to power on the back of a coup that uh, removed uh, former president uh, Evo Morales uh, following uh, elections uh, late last year. Uh, Janine Añez was installed uh, as the president after Morales was forced to resign uh, because of this coup and was only meant to preside over an interim presidency that was meant to see elections occur on May one. Instead, what we've seen is that Janine Añez uh, still remains in power, uh, has been as much as possible attempting to avoid elections using the, the pandemic as an excuse to uh, suppress democracy, and has been exposed to have been completely inept, uh, completely failed in the attempt to actually deal with the pandemic uh, in Bolivia, where you now have a situation to where morgues are unable to deal with the amount of deaths that are occurring, so dead bodies are left to be basically out on the streets. Um, Families have no place to be able to bury uh, their dead, uh, you know, seeing seen horrific scenes. What we've seen is that the Bolivian government's response, far from being a health first response, was ultimately or primarily framed as a maintenance of power response. So what did this involve? It involved a number of things. Firstly, involved maintaining and escalating the repression that had already been carrying out against dissidents in particular members of the movements towards socialism, the party that Evo Morales uh, heads, 
uh, and is the main contender in the upcoming presidential elections that have now finally been rescheduled for September 1, although we'll see if they actually go ahead on those days. So whilst the repression was already underway, under the guise of the pandemic, uh, the government has been using so-called uh, health threats um, to uh, imprison, detain, uh, to persecute um, members of the movement towards socialism. We've also seen alongside uh, this, this repression, uh, a, a, a sense, a, a, an attempt by the government to politicise the pandemic. We've even had scandalous cases where hospitals that were uh, projects that have been started under the Evo Morales government and which were due to be opened, having their opening delayed so that the new interim government could paint the hospitals green, which is the colour of the party that Agnes uh, will be running for, in order to then be able to present these as somehow projects that her new interim government had brought about as part of the electioneering that's going on. So again, a prioritisation of the maintenance of power rather than the, the real basic health needs. Another important differentiation between the way the Venezuelan government has handled the, the, the pandemic and the Bolivian government is that while both have imposed uh, national lockdowns of, at different degrees and at different times, Venezuelan government has always made as big attempt uh, to at least try to alleviate the worst aspects of those national lockdowns, uh, essentially um, covering wages of workers in public and private sector, uh, reducing, if not completely eliminating rents, uh, payment of bills, uh, these kind of hardships that, of course, you're unable to pay for if, if you're unable to, to go to work. Um, whereas in Bolivia, very little was offered. At first, nothing was offered. Only when initial protests uh, against the quarantine began did the government essentially um, uh, bump up a bit of the existing social payments that were already being handed out as a result of the Evo Morales government and, and a couple of one-off payments that, that were given out. And then finally decided that rather than try to um, bear any more economic cost, would simply start to uh, lift, the, lift the quarantine and allow people to go to work. And what we've seen as a result is just a, an escalation of, of, of the cases and, and deaths in Bolivia, a crisis that's already seen one health minister resign. It's already seen the government involved in a corruption scandal for overbilling of ventilators in, into the country. So it's just been scandal after scandal, uh, which itself has then been reflected in Giannis's uh, decline in the polls, where many had seen her as the potential unity candidate uh, to challenge against the movement towards socialism, uh, whereas now the polls show her as a as a distance third. Uh, so it's in that case, it's unsurprising that her, she's been seeking to delay the elections to try to see if she can regain some political capital before uh, Bolivians go to the polls. Uh, in a situation where uh, current polls are indicating that uh, were elections to be held today, the movement towards socialism would not only win, come first in the elections, but would be an outright winner and avoid a second round, given the lead that they've now got against the, the second uh, favourite candidate. It's um you, uh, you you spoke about the whole the Taku attempt and Juan Guaido supposed self declared presidency. Uh, it's quite striking to me that the United States in foreign policy in the time of this global pandemic. Uh, has also not been putting health first. Um, so you've seen the tightening of the screws against Iran and also tightening of the screws against Venezuela as well. Can you speak about some of those aspects of what the United States has been doing um, to, uh, to uh, you know, tighten the screws against Maduro's Venezuela? Yeah, I think the... Just sorry a sec, there's a plane coming over. Okay, no worries, that's fine. We'll wait, wait a moment. I can't hear the plan anymore. It's gone for me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I, I think just as the Maduro government realised that it, it had a huge challenge on its hand, not, not just because COVID-19 is a huge challenge for any government, but because of the, the precarious economic and, and situation, the situation of the health system, the, the US administration also saw this as, as very much an, an opportunity um, that if it could, it could very much tighten the screws, it could uh, hope to achieve what its supposed aim or its, its real aim of the sanctions, uh, not, uh, is, which is basically to, to strangle the economy with the hope of creating some kind of internal uprising uh, or some kind of internal fracture within the government um, to, to bring down uh, Maduro. So we've seen a number of tightening of sanctions. We've seen the attempts to block um, the, the entrance of uh, Iranian tankers carrying petrol, uh, one of the latest shortages to really start hitting hard in, in Venezuela is petrol, something that 
that seems illogical given the huge oil reserves that Venezuela has, but essentially large part because of the effects of these sanctions and the debilitation of the state oil company PDVSA. Uh, Venezuela is no, not really in a position now to be able to refine its oil into petrol. And so it's faced extreme shortages uh, in, 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 in this commodity. So really the US government has thought, well, now we could tighten, if we tighten sanctions now, this could really be the time where, where things to begin to erupt. And it must be noted that there have been uh, you know, uh, whilst small scale, not completely insignificant um, protests, rights, uh, cases of looting, by and large in smaller, medium-sized towns, perhaps those towns that have been the hardest for uh, government efforts to get to, uh, to resolve the issues, or others might say perhaps the ones that have been least prioritised while the government has given, you know, focused on the bigger cities, uh, in part for electoral political reasons, in part because if the COVID was to spread in those areas, it would have you know, the largest and most devastating impact. Um, so, but, but at the same time, the government's ability, the Venezuelan government's ability to respond to COVID uh, and how it has responded to it has almost overwhelmingly been seen as a positive, even including by detractors of the government. Very few are willing to say that the government has mishandled uh, the situation. Some may claim that the figures are a bit rubbery, they're not completely accurate. But when, when people look around to, uh, you know, on Brazil to the right of Venezuela, uh, to Peru and Ecuador and Chile, on, on, on geographically to the left or politically to the right of Venezuela and see the disasters that are happening there, um, it's very hard to fault the way that the, the Venezuelan government uh, has, has dealt, dealt with this pandemic. And it's really put the US in a bind because it's sort of, you know, you know, and we've seen it with some of the, the statements that have been coming out of the US administration, either uh, publicly or sort of through back channels, that there's sort of a real sense that perhaps the whole adventure with, with Juan Guaido, uh, including the latest episode uh, being uh, just a couple of weeks ago with the attempted invasion by US, uh, Colombian and Venezuelan mercenaries, uh, spectacularly failing, that many are sort of seeing that there's really little left uh, in, in this uh, project of, of, of the Juan Guaido interim presidency. And what's more, it now faces the, the challenge of, of how to deal with uh, National Assembly elections that have been scheduled for, uh, this, for this, uh, later this year in, in Venezuela, given that the, the National Assembly has really been the kind of the body uh, that the opposition have used to portray as the last remaining uh, democratic institution and have used to give some kind of uh, pretext or some kind of cover for the Juan Guaido presidency. Just briefly speaking about these sanctions, I mean, look, probably unless Australians are following Venezuela closely, they might not even know about the sanction regime. But just to clarify, these are illegal sanctions under international law, aren't they? Yeah, the, the, the sanctions are essentially defined as a as collective punishment and therefore seen as illegal by the, the United Nations. We have a, a range of sanctions and, and generally the, the focus that's given to the sanctions uh, by the US government and by supporters of the sanctions is this idea that they are just uh, individual sanctions targeting individual officials in the regime to uh, supposedly uh, stop them from being able to get access to, to, to their corrupt uh, earnings. The reality is, though, that the sanctions are much, much deeper and broader than that. And even if we just look at some of the individual sanctions, these are specifically targeted individual sanctions against key ministers in the government, which essentially stop those ministries being able to carry out any kind of trade agreements uh, with, with other countries. So already there, they have a much broader impact than just supposedly freezing bank accounts of, of individuals. But they also extend to companies doing dealings with, with Venezuela. They extend to, the, the in, in the case of uh, CITGO, the, the US uh, subsidiary of the state oil company PDVSA, the, essentially the, the, the theft of, of that uh, affiliate, PDVSA affiliate and handing it over to, to Juan Guaido. Um, and CITGO has been an important part of the, the funds and the, 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 the trade that Venezuela's had in terms of oil with, with the United States. All, all of these different sanctions really amount to, as I said, a, a collective punishment with, with the aim, even though they won't explicitly say this, um, but it's always really been what's driven a lot of these sanctions regimes, this, this conception that by strangling the economy and making the situation as unbearable as possible, um, the hope will be that people will turn against the government. Firstly, not only has history in general shown that that does not happen, 
uh, if anything, it only tends to solidify support uh, uh, with, with the state under siege. Uh, more importantly, in the case of Venezuela, an important section of the population continues to identify uh, with that government politically and sees that even despite these sanctions, uh, that government is, is working in its interest to try to, in this case, very specifically, as we've been talking about, uh, deal with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic in, in the best possible way to save as many lives as possible. Whenever we're in general campaigning for socialism, one of the common retorts you'll get is, oh, socialism, you don't want to end up like Venezuela. And I think if we look at the international response to this uh, pandemic, it's obviously not all one way, and clearly a virus doesn't care about political ideology. But some of the countries that have had the best responses, like uh, Venezuela, but also Vietnam and Cuba, are clearly sort of left-wing governments. And some of the governments that have had the worst response, like, I mean, obviously, I mean, Brazil, I think, would be up there. But even the United States is is right-wing and not, uh, you know, under Trump, it's almost like right-wing, not in just the sort of traditional mainstream right, but it's, uh, you know, uh, perhaps a bit further right than that. And some of the other right-wing governments in the world have also handled this crisis very badly. Are there ways in which a, which a left-wing approach uh, can help to solve practical problems like this? I think there, there's, there's very concrete evidence um, that where governments have taken a, a progressive left-wing approach to healthcare, um, whether that be from heavily funding a healthcare system so that it has an adequate healthcare system uh, that can, for instance, in the case of Cuba, uh, not just deal with combating COVID-19 at home, but actually is in a position to send doctors overseas to help other countries uh, com- combat the pandemic. Uh, whether it be because of progressive policies that understand that uh, whilst certain measures may be needed uh, to tackle the pandemic, such as home quarantine or state or regional or national lockdowns um, may be required, uh, that those measures must be accompanied uh, with measures that look after people's livelihoods uh, if they are to in any way be successful. Um, otherwise they are bound to fail. And we've seen that in numerous countries, as I mentioned before, uh, Bolivia just being one example of where the, the, the lockdown just had, you know, was un, unsustainable. And so therefore, rather than try to deal with that unsustainability, the government instead preferred to just begin to slowly lift it. And we've seen that the deaths that are occurring there. There's a lot of examples of how these kind of policies have been far better equipped uh, to deal with, with the pandemic. Uh, and we've even seen it in the case of where uh, you know, even even in many in a number of cases, right wing governments basically having lost complete control of the pandemic have been forced to implement policies that you know only weeks before they were decrying as as so called socialist communist policies. I think perhaps in, in some ways it's you no know, clearer example of you know the in in Britain where the the Boris Johnson government having completely failed uh, in the first uh, first few weeks of the pandemic essentially moved to implement a whole raft of economic policies that were just as, if not probably bigger in terms of their size than what Jeremy Corbyn had been offering in the last elections and which the media had decried as as left-wing lunacy. Um, So, you know, the the, the circumstances themselves have in some cases forced governments to go against their own um, uh, political uh, so-called ideologies or principles in order to, to implement other policies. Uh, so I think that there is a very strong lesson to, to be learned there. Of course, it doesn't resolve everything. Um, as you've mentioned, it is true. Uh, you know, I, I don't think uh, many people would want to live in the current situation that Venezuela is in at the moment, uh, putting aside the way they've dealt with the pandemic. Um, the economic situation there is extremely dire, but it's, of course, extremely dire for a whole range of reasons. Uh, the critics like to just focus on, oh, it's all to blame with socialism but ignore the, the history of colonialism, ignore the fact that Venezuela's economy has been completely dependent on oil well before Chavez and Maduro were in power, that the country they inherited had extremely high levels of poverty, uh, was an issue that only the Chavez government began to deal with. Uh, it's had to deal with economic sanctions. It's had to deal with a uh, hostile uh, uh, um, opposition internally within the country uh, that has led to sabotage of the oil industry that's a regular attempted at coups uh, any country would be hard pressed to still be any government was to be hard pressed to still be in power let alone uh, 
uh, to be able to uh, radically transform in uh, society. But I think what we see is that what is so powerful about these I- these ideas is you know the fact that they they do pros an alternative. They do show that something different uh, can be done uh, on a, on a, on a certain level. That's been seen with this this pandemic. Although of course very very few of the media are willing to pay any much attention to what's happening in whether it be Venezuela or Cuba or Vietnam or the state of Kerala in, in India or many other places uh, where progressive or left-wing forces are in power. Uh, the counter, I think, is certainly that if if the deaths in Venezuela were anywhere near on a per capita basis, what we've seen in countries like Brazil or Peru or Ecuador, you could absolutely be certain that it would be, you know, um, up at the top of the international news sections with renewed calls to have to get rid of the Maduro government in order to deal with the, the health impacts that, that is occurring. Uh, a call that you see in none of these other countries where you have, particularly in Brazil, you know, essentially a, a government that's explicitly stated it has no problem, or certainly at least a president, that it has no problems with, this, with the spread of this, this deadly pandemic um, occurring in, in his own country. So... I think that there is a lot of, lot of validity to that. It's important to be able to get some of this in, information um, out about how these responses are occurring because they also can be useful for drawing some kind of lessons to how in our own countries, in our own struggles, that we can begin to also um, put forward concrete proposals that are not only just uh, good ideas but that can actually uh, uh, chime in uh, or that can actually sort of come together with uh, people's... Uh, um, people's struggles, people's campaigns uh, for trying to deal with the, the, the hardships, the, the both health, social and economic hardships that they're facing as a result of this pandemic. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thanks, Fred, for, uh, for those insights. I would like to make one, one final plug again. Please become a Green Left Weekly supporter. It makes a big difference to our project. Again, if you haven't shared this video, please share the video and give it a thumbs up. See you next time.